My name is Mike Lemoyne. Um, I am, well, less new of the Director of Research and Recovery here at Skagit River System Cooperative. Um, as many of you know, Eric Beamer is um, moving to retirement um, and in the enjoyment of life rather than work. Um, and um, I've been filling in his stead and um, I was asked to give a uh, kind of brief overview of the freshwater component of the recovery plan. So the recovery plan is pretty big of a document all itself and it's got a few appendices that follow it. Um, there's a number of places where you can find the recovery plan. Um, one place is the Skagit River System Cooperative Documents page. We, we have it all there. Uh, but to help you in some of the components that are covered here, I provided page numbers in the proposal. So none of this should be very, uh, fairly new uh, to you all um, because it's been in the document. The document uh, has been around since 2005, seven-ish in there. And uh, But if you had a question specifically, you could go back to the document that I'm referencing. So again, I um, wanted to the, uh, thank everyone here for um, uh, bearing through. Hopefully uh, this is somewhat informative and slightly entertaining for you uh, <laughs> since you spend time with me and Richard. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about the freshwater restoration component. Um, so this is a lot of the uh, restoration actions in the recovery plan and part of the planning process. And specifically, this is mostly around chapter 10, but there's a few other sections I'm going to highlight. It's been a while since we've talked about the Federal Endangered Species Act, and I thought maybe we should take a moment to talk about the federal law that affects us all here in the Skagit Basin. And really talk about the two sections that the recovery plan really deals with. Um, and the first one I want to talk about is that recovery plans are required. Um, so when a species is listed as threatened or endangered, uh, under federal law, we have to have a recovery plan. And for Chinook salmon specifically, that onus kind of falls upon NOAA. But in Puget Sound, there's a lot of groundswell um, on the ground work where the local entities try to develop this. And, and recovery plans under 4F ESA are really important because, and I always kind of funny because 4F is after 4D, but you need 4F to get to 4D. And 4D is the take. So for us all to have take, which is a harassment of, so you don't have to kill fish, you just have to harass them. Um, and this is, again, the Federal Endangered Species Act, uh, nothing that I'm promoting one way or the other, this is just a law that we're following, is that we have to have a recovery plan. And that recovery plan then allows for threatened species, allows the ability to have 4D take, i.e. harassment, across all the activities that do occur across the basin. So one part of my previous job as a harvest manager was to develop um, analyses for harvest that may incidentally uh, catch um, ESA listed Chinook or steelhead. We also have hatchery genetic management plans that cover hatcheries. Um, hydropower has to deal with this in this FERC relicensing in some regard and our habitat, which is why we're all here today. So the actions and development that happen in habitat no reviews um, for ESA take. And I also want to highlight what we do in research and monitoring. We also have to go out through the Section 10 process and get a scientific collection permit. So the recovery plan allows us to then have 4D so that we can still do some of our normal day-to-day -day activities across the landscape um, in a sensible way that we can still achieve recovery and meet the federal requirements in the federal law. So under 4F, um, and I pulled this straight from Noah's website, uh, there are some components of the plan that you must have, a recovery plan. And you must meet these components to be authorized either by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, if it's an inland fish and, and wildlife species, NOAA generally takes care of the anatomist species, like salmon and steelhead. And so what we need is we need a description of basically site-specific management action, like what we're going to do on the ground to achieve recovery. We also need to have measurable objectives, measurable criteria that we reach objectives that may, the whole point of the recovery plan is reaching to delisting so that we don't have to deal with the 4D biological opinions and all those type of things. 
Um, and for the Nadjama species, NOAA is the authorizing agency that authorizes the recovery plan and actually implements the 4T take assessments. The Chinook recovery plan um, followed a lot of these components um, and is, is kind of broken out into major sections. Again, I'm rehashing this because it's been a while since we've talked about the entire plan. And so I just wanted to hit, brush upon this again. And uh, fundamentally to the start in the recovery plan, uh, what we've done here is centered around the Chinook salmon biology. And the idea is if it's biologically based, we have the best chance to achieve our biological outcomes through any restorative uh, reduction of harvest actions, uh, effects of hatcheries and those type of things. And so the other component is identify factors that limit Chinook salmon. And NOAA has actually provided guidance in, to this, the McElhenney 2000, which is uh, criteria for viable salmon populations, which highlights that population size, the growth rate of population, how spatially it's spread and its structure over space, and its diversity. And when we talk about single species, it often refers to diff diversity of life history types. And these are ideas of trying to make sure there's resilience in the population. And you know, often it, you have this list of limiting factors. What are the things that might be limiting the population responses on the landscape? So here's the four H's, harvest, um, hatcheries, hydropower, and habitat. Um, then you go through and you try to list what corrective actions you might do across the landscape. Um, so if you have issues with spatial structure, maybe you need to remove barriers. Um, if you have capacity issues, maybe you need more land. Or if you have just um, toxic compounds, so like some recovery plans really focus on ideas of like toxic compounds across the landscape. Um, these actions in our recovery plan are, are really focused on harvest. Um, and there's been marked and well-documented reductions in harvest that Casey Ruff, Bob McClure, and James Dixon highlighted in early presentation. Um, we're going round and round um, to make sure that our official production is not hampering ESA listed species in the Skagit. Um, a major component in the in the Skagit recovery plan is habitat protection. So protecting the habitat we already have because we this is a very beautiful place and we have good habitat in place. And then what can we gain back to get to delisting within restoration? And obviously this component, when the plan was written in 2005, none of us knew everything and there was still more learning that needed to happen. And, but the goal is to have, or the goal is to set it based off of measurable criteria. And within the recovery plan, that is both the number of adults was the measurable criteria and the productivity, the adult to recruit adult relationships was the, um, goal there. So let's go back to um, salmon biology 101. So the Chinook life cycle um, within the recovery plan, it was set by uh, both the work group and the co-authors that we must set it within the life cycle. These fish use a variety of habitats to complete their life cycle and to maintain that abundance and productivity. And so we need to think about all the habitats and how those fish move through. So again, Adults lay eggs in the gravels. Those gravels emerge, use certain types of freshwater habitats, also use estuarine habitats, and then go out to the ocean for a few years and then come back to the freshwater system, lay their eggs. And so there's a lot of area in which humans can impact um, their demographies, their births and death rates, if you will, um, across this life cycle. And the recovery plan tries to highlight that, both from smothering of eggs um, that uh, Gus and Kurt talked about in the previous uh, spring meeting and how successful we've been in working with timber industries to reduce some of those sediment rates, um, tributary impacts, floodplains, uh, the estuary that we've talked about a lot, um, near shore areas and the open ocean. So there are major components to the recovery plan, which I just highlighted there. I kind of got ahead of myself in the talk. Within the life cycle, there are some distinct life history pathways. So Chinook, in a way, choose to um, go a certain pathway after they emerge from the egg. And we've seen this in this gadget, and it's documented throughout the range of Chinook, that we have both ocean type and stream type. Ocean type are those fish that leave within the first year of emergence. Those stream type are those fish that leave after one year of emergence. And we've given them more subsplit names where we have this idea of 
fish that leave and then immediately go to the estuary and rear in the estuary for a few weeks to a few months, which are our estuary rears. We have some fish that just leave and go. Um, and we know they don't do very well in ocean survival because they're leaving a really small size. And then we have these fish that rear within the floodplain habitats for a few weeks, a few months before they before they go out to the saltwater. They're still that ocean type, but they require some freshwater habitat, primarily floodplain habitat. And then we have our yearlings, which are those fish that stay in the entire time, which are our stream type. And so all of these are very important as we think of if there's going to be a restoration action on on in a certain habitat, who is it that we're restoring for, and that's really a common objective to restoration. Is it this delta rear? Is it a par migrant that's going to be um, only within a certain season within the floodplain habitat, or the, these yearling fish that are going to be around for a long time? I've kind of alluded to this already in the talk, uh, but we've hit some of the major sections of um, of the recovery plan and certain actions. Um, so we talked about spawning incubation. We talked about tidal delta rearing, a little bit about near shore, and then some with ocean survival with our harvest managers. And so today we're going to be focusing on the freshwater rearing, which is focusing on floodplains and some of the non-tidal delta. And so to give you spatially kind of the representation of the freshwater area, um, again, directly from the schedule recovery plan, we see that the, the river and tributary system is a really large area. Um, and the non-tidal delta is this kind of sandwich area in between, and then we have the tidal delta. And one thing you're gonna say is like, wow, that's those are some really different like spatial extents. And obviously ocean survival is probably the largest or is the largest of, of all the spatial extents. And you always have to think about, it. it's not just the picture on the map and, and just how big or small they are. It's also, how the fish utilize them and how within their different life history pathways and how that fits within the life cycle to achieve the recovery goal of adults or adult to recruit productivity. So to kind of start in with some of the freshwater work in the recovery plan, um, address the non-tidal delta section is pretty short. Um, most of the non-tidal delta has been lost um, and it is in the populated area. And there was a, a few projects listed. Um, we have to say within the range of Chinook, we're, we're not fully certain how Chinook use these areas because these non-tidal delta areas are the areas most impacted across the West Coast. This is where people live primarily. So it's the first place it's developed and we don't have a lot of information. There's some assemblance from Canada or some understanding from Canada that there may be specific life history types like a, a longer par migrant life history that's like somewhere in between a par and a yearling. but it it's ephemeral knowledge. Like we don't quite know for sure one way or the other. And so there's not a, a very much in a way of prescriptions here, but there was a couple of what thought to be sensible restoration projects that um, Richard will get into down, down the road. Um, one was implemented, which is Brit Slough, and we're actually doing some of the monitoring on Brit Slough right now. In the floodplain, so above, so this is getting into the floodplain habitats, as you can see, that's a really large spatial area. And the first thing what we identified is within the range of Chinook. So when I say range, I'm talking from California to Alaska. Um, so where Chinook are and getting a broad understanding of their ecology. And we understand that um, they use floodplain habitat. And so to get our head around in the recovery plan, and when I say our, it really wasn't me, I was an author of that recovery plan, but it was a broad group of individuals some of you are in this meeting um, to try to identify what might be going on in the floodplain. The first thing that was done was an attempt to map of what has changed and what may contribute to the loss of productivity in the system for Chinook. And so one thing that was identified was a number of um, hydro modifications. So those things that kind of line down um, both the main river channel and within the floodplain that blocks the natural ability of the river to move laterally. And some of those structures are, are obviously really important. Um, we have homes, livelihoods, and transportation out there. And then some of those structures are, 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 are just remnants out there. And so the idea is, where are we seeing loss? And overall, throughout the entire basin, we saw a 28.6% loss from historical conditions of that floodplain functionality. And we 
fared down into some of those areas um, to try to see what are areas in which some restoration possibly happened and spread it out so that we're not focused in one area and it's um, spread out across the basin. One, to provide benefit to multiple populations and getting that diversity and spatial structure component of the recovery plan. And two, to make sure, as I presented before in section eight, that not any one land use or area um, is bearing the brunt of the burden of rest, uh, recovery. Most of this investigation, what we're seeing is it affects this potential life history type. And what happened in the recovery plan is we wanted to confirm that that life history type was here. And what that life history type is, is these PAR migrants. And so in the recovery plan, looking at the scoop trap data, we see, and this has been consistent since then, is that there's this week 15 that we start seeing these migrants that look like they rear, they've grown, they've most likely eaten something in the fresh water. And so they put on some length and they are different than this period of what we call early migrants. So we see this really obvious change over the time. Now, the week that this changes is not always week 15. It could be week 16 or week 14, depending on temperatures and flows and all those type of things. But we do see this substantive change. And these PAR migrants, we then dove into the floodplain habitat and we see that they're all over the place in the floodplain and they seem to really want to be in these areas. There was a lot of work done early on, um, Bob Heyman to start in the Skagit Basin to try to inform the recovery plan. And what we saw was consistently fish were using the floodplain habitat and that they were uh, preferring natural shorelines over armor shorelines, that we were seeing five times increase in densities in natural shorelines. So we're, we're now developing this picture that fish like floodplains and they like naturally occurring floodplains. So building the evidence that restoration likely is needed to improve productivity. And, and through that, even after recovery plan, we've done substantive work with some different questions, but the, the story is the same. Chinook need floodplains and they need natural floodplains to improve their productivity. And what we see in, in the Skagit at the time that we wrote the recovery plan is that we've had a net loss of floodplain habitat um, through a variety of reasons. And with that net loss, what we also started seeing evidence at the time the recovery plan was written was that there seems to be some cleaving off of these PAR migrants. So at certain abundance um, of potential production, eggs in the ground or, or number of adults the previous year, we don't get any more PAR migrants in the system. It flattens off which suggests to us there is a capacity, we're reaching some kind of capacity to the system. We also see that the fish start choosing to be a, become earlier migrants, they become these fry migrants. And if I can put it in, in simple terms, you might like, you might on a Friday night wanna go out to a restaurant and you wanna go out to your favorite restaurant. And if it's too busy, you might go somewhere else. And and what the evidence was pointing to was the fish maybe were making these decisions that it was filling up in the floodplain and then they were heading out to the estuary. So this is during the plan. And, you know, this is not a lot of data points on there. But after the plan in, in 2015, um, a, a co-authored paper uh, by Eric Beamer, Mars Zimmerman was the lead author, Corey Green, so state federal and tribal uh, scientists um, re-looked at this question and they have corroborating evidence to the original plan is that amongst these PAR migrants, we see this limiting, this capacity being reached of our PAR migrants, suggesting that there is limited freshwater um, habitat, floodplain habitat for them, thus doubling down on the need to create more habitat to get more fish. Um, conversely, with our yearling popular, with our yearling life history type, there was no signal of reaching that capacity or meeting that density dependence, um, and such that we don't think that that life history type is really in a density dependent relationship. Also, with those smaller uh, fry migrants, there was no freshwater density dependence. Um, they seemed to be just passing through the system and heading out the estuary. 
and is what you've heard in Eric's previous uh, presentation in the estuary, these fry migrants tend to show a capacity limitation as well. Brass taxes recovery plan for salmonids are really on the backbone of these stock recruitment curves. It is, it is the methodology that we have um, following basically that we do spawn ground surveys to get adult abundances. And at times we have some smolt data to, to uh, uh, use as well. And, and really what we have is the number of spawners and then how many recruits they produce the subsequent years. Um, for Chinook, it's a little bit more complicated because we have Chinook that return as age two to age five. And so we have to reconstruct those. But in the end, what we do is get the number of recruits per that spawner. And we're able then to develop a productivity term, which is down low on the number of spawners, how many fish can we pump out of the system when spawners are low? And then we have a carrying capacity or, or density dependent term which tells us at what point do we start getting less uh, recruits per spawner that they're competing with one another is, is the general assumption. And so when we are able to um, map these out, we can then set recovery goals by looking at how we might shift that curve to get more spawners and to improve potentially the number of recruits. So we set a current level and then a recovery goal and there's a memo on the SRC website from Bob Heyman that discussed these in detail. And you can actually look at the specific curves. I cartoonized it here because, well, Bob was very detailed oriented. And so there was a lot of detail in his curves and I just wanted to make it simple for y'all to see here. This is where we get uh, some of our recovery goals in the Skagit Basin. And, um, and what we established was that we know that ocean conditions also change. So, there was an idea of both that intrinsic productivity score, that R score in their stock recruitment curve, and then a, a, a total abundance um, following the idea of a maximum sustainable yield. And we had a high survival rate in the ocean and what that should look like versus a low survival rate. And currently today, most of our survival rates are estimating down to lower number or, or below that. And that's kind of where we're operating as, as a way to link what Casey and Bob and James are talking about to the recovery goal here. Um, but overall, these are the goals and this is what we're trying to attain. The number of adults or adult to adult spawner to adult recruit productivity. Given our past conversations with this group, I couldn't walk away from this conversation without talking about smoke capacity numbers. I hope some of you very much appreciate that. And I thought I could go through this and describe very uh, broadly about smoke capacity numbers and how they're derived. Um, so we're going to focus on the freshwater smoke capacity numbers, and it's and but all of them are broken out by the different life history types or life history pathways within the cycle. And and so with recovery plan, um, there is a freshwater. Um, uh, estimate of what we could get from smolt capacity from restoration or, or what is possibly needed to meet our recovery goals uh, for par migrants and yearling. Now, a lot of folks have set, set this in stone, but could we get, let's say, one point, could we do actions on the landscape to get us 1.5 million par migrants, but only get 90,000 yearling and meet our goal? Yes, they have different ocean survival, and these numbers could fluctuate around. The ultimate goal is the number of adults and the adult to adult recruitment number. Um, these are some guidelines to potentially try to explain it. And actually, if you go to page 284, these numbers were supposed to represent how we how recovery was going to be shared across the basin. It was supposed to show from the different habitats that we need to get to recovery, again, if we are at recovery and they're delisted, those 4D permits aren't needed anymore. Like we can then go through a more co-managed process. And that's the real goal that we're trying to get to is, is alleviate the burden of recovery and to get these species so that they are supporting um, the people and the place in the system. So how do you get to this number? So what we do is we had first identify what are the goals, what, what are the adult needs for delisting? 
And, and that is a conversation that um, can happen with multiple groups. In this situation, it seemed to happen mostly through the co-managers, the tribes in the state with NOAA to get to the sufficient goal. The next step is to identify the limiting factors associated with um, what is happening on the landscape. Here I'm focusing on freshwater. So limiting factors were this idea of hydro modifications that were limiting the floodplain habitat and the identify of density dependence within the floodplain. Now it was a question of like, what if we did implement restoration, what is the potential of um, new habitat from restoration? which can be kind of tricky. So you have impacted habitat. If you remove that impact, what new habitat you can gain? And there was work done in the Skagit Basin to try to relate a floodplain width. So the overall width of the floodplain and the amount of available habitat or the amount of habitat available by different habitat types. Here I represent A backwaters. This is on page 20, but there's a list of different habitat criteria. And, and so the idea is, okay, if you did a restoration here, this is how much wetted area or, or amount, of, amount of fish habitat you're going to get, um, which was the next step in the process. The next thing is to try to populate that, that new supposedly area that you're going to get with numbers of fish. And so using um, both external published data or unpublished data and what has been done locally here, there was density estimates um, derived for these different habitat types. So once you get an area of the potential amount of uh, fish habitat you can get for that area, then you could populate the amount of fish that might be in that area. And overall, that's applied to trying to get an idea of what capacity you're going to get for the system. And then what we do is we apply an ocean survival based off of the life history pathway. And through that ocean survival, we can get the number of adults produced. And that then brings it back to the goal. I want to highlight that this is simplified. There's a lot more detail within the plan. Page numbers are provided. Um, but to make this a appropriate consumable presentation, um, I, I've tried to simplify it to show you the general process. I guess we wanted to transition a little bit at this point. And, um, Folks know that in these past Salmon Science series, we've really focused on uh, sharing how the recovery plan came to the conclusions, what it, what it said and why, um, with some updates where those updates are possible. But we've, we've stopped short to, in today's presentation and generally in providing sort of new knowledge um, that's come along. And so we're gonna highlight what some of that is and set us up for some future um, conversations. Uh, but to finish out the formal part of the presentation today, we just wanted to share um, the restoration site selection um, rationale in the recovery plan and uh, some of the progress that's been made in implementing freshwater rearing capacity actions uh, since the adoption of the plan. So here uh, in chapter 10 for freshwater rearing, uh, restoration site selection, it mentions uh, multiple factors that Mike's touched on um, already. So of course, um, if you're looking across the landscape and identifying um, habitat limiting factors and stressors in the, uh, in the floodplain, you'd be looking first and foremost to reconnecting isolated rearing habitats. Um, so there's a lot of focus there on where are some of these sites, old sloughs that have been disconnected, usually from hydro modifications or undersized culverts and those kinds of things. Um, second, after uh, prioritizing reconnecting isolated rearing habitats, there was a strong focus, as Mike said, on restoring hardened stream banks. And um, there's two reasons for that. One. Um, that Mike touched on is to encourage channel formation. You know, if you allow the river to erode and continue to move across the floodplain over decadal time spans, you'll develop and maintain these off channel areas, which we know are uh, just the numbers just presented are much more productive um, for these juveniles and would, um, you know, have been 
seriously impacted over the last um, 150 years. But uh, second, also this on the site scale itself, that the uh, steep vertical banks with more um, uh, velocity has lower rearing habitat an order of five, five times, right? Um, so that's where the recovery plan says that if there's large amounts of floodplain to be restored, we really should be setting back infrastructure, pulling it out, setting back roads, and that kind of thing where we can gain that extra floodplain habitat. If, is, if there's not as much habitat to be gained um, because you're at the edge of the floodplain or there's development and that kind of thing that can't be restored, then the, the plan talks about softening um, the bank armor sites. Um, finally, in the site selection process, the recovery plan talks about filling gaps in longitudinal rearing habitat availability. So that's this concept that we wanted um, you know, a string of pearls along the river from the top to bottom to make sure that there you know, aren't artificially created uh, gaps in those rearing habitats. So those are the big um, uh, factors that uh, the recovery plan talks about. And it also covers, of course, that our actions should be cost effective. <clears throat> you know, if you're choosing between sites and one's far more expensive than another, that's obviously an important factor for us. And then the impacts on the community um, as well. And that's where you might choose to do bank softening rather than uh, setback of infrastructure. So this is from the recovery plan. And uh, Mike shared uh, this uh, habitat analysis briefly. And there's a series of maps here that walks through the entire watershed. And I have those um, copied to show you quickly. And I'm gonna then summarize them in one table um, in just a few slides here. Um, but this shows from the bottom to the top of the system. And the uh, yellow areas are those gaps in rearing habitat availability. And the uh, green then are some of the possible sites that were identified back in 2005. I like when Mike said, you know, knowledge was imperfect, right? These were conceptual potential sites. And really, we didn't know an awful lot about the sites and their benefits and impacts. And that's what we've been trying to assess for the last 15 years and move this um, restoration process forward. So here's some examples of those sites. Mike shared this. And on the right, you'll see um, the current day uh, 1991 status. And again, green um, identified sites like River Bend. Um, or the Salem LC. Um, so, th so that's some examples. And then you kind of march up the system and you'll find other, um, other floodplains that are disconnected in sight. So I'm gonna just kind of march through these, these go all the way up through the sock and get to the punchline. Um, and so this is table 10.3 in the uh, Skagit Chinook recovery plan. And it shows the uh, rearing reaches for each of the six stocks and um, also the possible habitat restoration actions there in the middle column. And I tried to summarize on the right side that um, while it, it, right here it shows 14 identified actions, there's actually some additional green triangles on the maps. And so there's about 19 possible actions and sites identified in the recovery plan. And of those, uh, four of them have been partially restored. So, um, you know, after 18 years uh, since the recovery plan was authored, um, we've gotten through four of those 19 possible sites um, that have been pa uh, partially restored. So uh, Mike mentioned uh, Brit Slough, a project completed last year by the Skagit Fisheries Enhancement Group and um, Conservation District and owned by Department of Fish and Wildlife. And that's being actively monitored now to look at that increase in smoke capacity. Um, and then Cottonwood Slough, uh, there, were, there was a, a big project identified in the recovery plan as a possibility. And after some years of feasibility, um, essentially concluded that it's not uh, sustainable to um, be able to restore the Cottonwood Slough site. However, there was 
a road removal at the outlet of Cottonwood Slough. And so that did restore a, a nice chunk of rearing habitat at the bottom end of the slough. Um, there was some restoration done at the Salem um, Mitigation Bank site, just upstream of Mount Vernon, um, but it was a partial restoration um, that focused on wetlands instead of Chinook habitat. Um, so that um, did not happen at a full scale. And then a lab at Fan and uh, the project you all are probably quite familiar with around phases one and two and the alluvial fan restoration with the new bridge spans on Alabic Creek. So, so that's just kind of a snapshot of the actions that have been implemented, um, but there's actually been a lot of other uh, projects that have been implemented in that um, same time frame in the freshwater area. So one that was uh, spearheaded by Skagit County was the Robinson Road Orphan Rock Removal. Another, I wouldn't call it a project, but um, there was a lot of work in Lyman Slough and then uh, an avulsion through Lyman Slough that addressed some of the bank armoring there. And then some work by um, the county and others to try to mitigate the damage that was done by that natural avulsion. Um, and then uh, Cumberland Creek Slough, where the land trust worked with the Corps of Engineers to implement a mitigation project on Cumberland Creek. Uh, also Davis Slough, this was an isolated slough that had an undersized culvert and the Skagit Fisheries Enhancement Group worked with Skagit County Public Works to replace that with a bridge, opening up those extra freshwater rearing acres. And of course, Barnaby Slough, phase one, where um, levees, uh, at, let's, let's call them orphan levees and uh, other infrastructure was uh, removed on Department of Fish and Wildlife land by the Skagit River System Cooperative um, in partnership with Seattle City Light and TNC. Um, SFEG also worked on Preston Park Channel um, connection, uh, creation um, with Skagit County Parks. And then the SRSC worked on Bryson Road Armor Project in the Sauk River as well. Um, and then the Snohomish County uh, replaced Sauk Prairie Bridge and did some mitigation work on the slough upstream. And then in Suwattle, there was also some riprap removal by the Skagit River System Cooperative. And then finally, uh, these alluvial fans. There's actually been quite a bit of work in the lower areas of our major tributaries in recognition that uh, they provide a lot of rearing habitat. So Nooka Champs, Day Creek, Hanson Creek, and Downey Creek in Swaddle um, are those main sites um, that have been updated. So I think um, one of the, uh, next steps for us is there's been an extensive process to monitor all the estuary projects and get, get a handle on how it's impacting fish. And we're really at the stage now where it's time to do an inventory of these projects, put them into a kind of a map book and um, do a better job with sort of storytelling around the effectiveness of these projects. But at least we do have the catalog of projects that have been completed in freshwater. Maybe I can add in that last comment that you had, Richard. Um, so of these projects, um, there, there actually is a slew of, um, excuse, I guess the pun there on that, um, of uh, re uh, restoration monitoring happening. So uh, I know for, for just SRC, we're participating in the Brit slew evaluation Barnby phase one, the elaborate alluvial fan. Um, and we are um, working on some others here pretty pretty quickly in the near future. So um, I do think you're right, Richard, is that it's time to start ramping this up. And we're definitely interested in, in ramping, ramping this up and moving forward. So, uh, and then with that, um, Richard, did you keep the, thank you. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to highlight, and um, Jen O'Neill had a really nice comment and um, caught a flub of mine, 
where Zimmerman et al. couldn't distinguish between density dependence or independence of the yearly life history type. I misspoke and said it was density independent. Um, we don't know. It should be the answer. And I hope that she will also present maybe in one of the follow-up meetings what she is learning at NSD, working with others about um, yearling habitat that at the time of the Skagit Recovery Plan, we didn't know really where Chinook yearling were all across the landscape and what habitats they used. And there's been a three-phase project to try to understand that. Um, and sometimes it's just really hard to find fish. Um, let's just say that. Uh, we are at SRC still continuing to try to estimate marine survival trends over time, specifically with the hatchery code wire tag and indicator stocks out there. But we're always trying to make sure that we have a sense and a pulse on marine survival. But over the recent years, too, why we start investigating this more, there's there's other gaps that um, I personally know of. And I think a lot of you out there also have gaps in knowledge that maybe we should start pulling together. But um, and those are that identifying seasonally disconnected habitats that seem to be producing yearling um, are our interest in a research project that we're working on with Oregon State University right now in the Skagit Basin. Um, better sense of population specific productivity. Um, we're hopefully going to leverage some current stuff to do otolith microchemistry to determine natal origin of juvenile fish to try to get a sense of that that's pop the, of the six populations what is the specific productivity that's going to take some time to figure out and then uh what you saw earlier in Catherine's proposal of better trying to understand these alluvial fan transitions into the floodplain when does alluvial fan become more similar to a floodplain habitat and thus applying those expectations of uh small capacity estimates versus when are they perched above and something different so so we hope in the near future um, that there'll be some more presentations of this um, uh, research component to fill some of the gaps of knowledge. Thank you mm -hmm. both to Mike and Richard, and let's open it up for either comment or questions. And Mike, I didn't quite catch on the seasonally disconnected habitats. What's the their relative importance or yeah, so. Them or or... It's been some stuff that they've been evaluating on the east side, and these are areas that um, are, are floodplain habitats are only connected during high flow, like periodically over high flow. And what they found in the Metau and Eniet that they tend to be yearling producers, like really big yearling producers. And so the first thing that we're trying to do with the grad student is get an inventory because they haven't been mm -hmm. really inventoried in the Skagit. And then in what, and then what fish are there? And then generally, what are the survivorship over that summer period? And we're starting to get some descriptions and that information. I'm hoping Catherine Austin um, at SRC is working with the grad student. I'm hoping that she will be able to present on that maybe in the next talk mm -hmm. to, to really kind of fill out some new things that we're learning. Um, and that progression of knowledge since the recovery plan, which I think some of this series is intended to do. I mean, that's a great summary. And, and thanks for putting, you know, more in context. And, you know, maybe not everybody got it, but seeing some of the numbers and the relative, you know, need for improvement in different um, stanzas, if you will, almost, um, I think it's quite, it's good to ref, you know, refresh that memory. Because people do think it's all about one part of the system, and it's not. I've wondered if uh, Mike would be willing to recap just very briefly for us the status of freshwater uh, status and trends monitoring, what, what we're doing there. We debated uh, sharing more of that with everybody um, like we did with my estuary, but um, didn't go down that road today, um, but we can. Um, yeah, I, I can. So SRC, we, we went under this activity to try to do like a 20 year evaluation of um, of the recovery plan. And, and one of the first things that we identified is that PRISM and some of these state databases of, of from the surfboard aren't very reliable if you're trying to use them as predictors to fish change. And um, they're, I think they're more reliable in a in a project management evaluation and tracking, but when it comes to the actual trying to use them as predictors to the ecology, 
or the biology of this fish, they're problematic. So we've gone through a, what we call a habitat SAS and trends, which was a three to four year effort to try to map what I would call a habitat change analysis, like trying to map and document the change of habitat over time. And for the estuary, that was pretty successful. We we're able to digitize in um, using aerial photos, changes in channel areas where we've had gains and losses through some, some RTK GPS. And we've been able to do that also with changes in vegetation because a lot of it, you can deal with it through an aerial photo and you don't have to spend the resources and the time to out there doing on the ground surveys. The challenge with the floodplain is there's trees mm -hmm. and trees obscure a lot of the aquatic habitat. And so um, I don't know if Rick Harston's on here, but some of the hydro mod surveys that Upper Skag's done, that was a many years floating a lot of river um, to try to in inventory the hydro mods. And that was just from a lot of just the edge of the river survey. Uh, but to go in there and actually map habitat change over time was, was complicated. So we didn't, Rich and I talked about, it, we didn't want to present it because it, I, I don't think we were very successful at measuring. And so we're at a point at, in, in our program to have a reassessment of how we might do that better. Um, I know Jason Hall of Kramer Sciences has a publication out there with the Skagit as one of the examples trying to get at some of those measures. But the idea is measuring habitat in such a way that's relative, that's relevant to the fish biology so that we can see what is changing. What are we changing on landscape? What's successfully being changed in restoration? What might be, what might we be losing through other activities or natural processes? And then what are we seeing in productivity and abundance of fish? And, and you really need both of those. That's why habitat SAS and trends is important. Um, like I said, we had some complications in mapping that and we don't feel very good using that in this, in this inference. Um, for, for floodplain, you just saw a couple months ago, a really great proposal where we were successful at mapping habitat SAS and trends with forestry, uh, mm -hmm. uh activities. Mm -hmm. And we have very clear, so Delta. Uh, upland forestry stuff, we were successful. Floodplain, we were less successful. Yeah, and I, I just put into the chat a link to our resources page on there. There's a long report, an executive summary report on that more people would probably enjoy reading. Um, that is our 2020 monitoring and adaptive management report. And just in, in summary, we were able to show, you know, that uh, status of trends of habitat in the estuary, um, in connectivity longitudinally with culverts, in um, uplands, uh, sediment reduction, in nearshore pocket estuaries that were making more progress than we're losing in all of those regimes. But the way I'd couch it, uh, Mike, is that the freshwater monitoring, you know, the noise in the way we measured it. Um, we're not sure that that actually produced a signal or just the noise. And so the freshwater side is, is one where we haven't concluded that we're making progress and that may be measuring, or it may be that we're just not doing enough work at the scale in our freshwater rearing habitat, um, you know, at this point, at this time. I, sorry, if I, uh, that's a better way to say it. Yeah, it's, it's a measurement error situation yeah, right. with a freshwater. Right, right. Peter. Yeah, I just have, uh, for the least knowledgeable guy on the call today, I just really, really appreciate Mike and Richard, how clear this was. This has really been interesting and helpful. So thank you for that. I'd sometimes sit in these and just cringe at how much I don't know. This was very helpful. So I do have to drop off. I just don't want to miss an opportunity to thank you for a really good presentation. So thanks. Thanks, Peter. Welcome. Appreciate it.